Hello, and welcome to the webinar, An Antidote to Fake News, a conversation between Mark Kingwell and Tom Chatfield. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the editor of the Social Science Space website. Let me introduce you to our guest for today's webinar. Mark Kingwell is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto and a contributing editor of Harper's Magazine. He is author or co-author of 18 books of political, cultural, and aesthetic theory. In addition to many scholarly articles, his writing has appeared in more than 40 mainstream magazines and newspapers. His most recent books are the linked essay collections Unruly Voices from 2012, Measure Yourself Against, Earth, Against the Earth from 2015, and last year's book about games and philosophy, Fail Better, Why Baseball? He is at work on a book about the politics of boredom in the 21st century. Tom Chatfield is also a philosopher and author of a new book from Sage Publishing called Critical Thinking. Tom is interested in improving our experiences of digital technology and better understanding its use through critical thought. His six books include in, um, Exploring Digital Culture, such as Live This Book and Netymology, have appeared in over two dozen countries and languages. A launch columnist for BBC's worldwide technology site, BBC Future, Tom appears widely in the international media and is a regular, as you can guess, on BBC radio and television. He is currently writing a series of thrillers for Hotter set in the world of the dark net. Now, we at SAGE are proud of Tom's new book, Critical Thinking which is written for students and curious thinkers of all types. It covers the principles of good argument, reasonable explanation, critically engaged reading, and confident writing, as well as explorations of cognitive bias, managing your time and attention, and what it means to engage successfully with technology in an age of social media and ever more powerful automation. We're offering a discount code on the book of 25% through February 16th for webinar registrants. Use the code UKSSK25 when ordering the book at sagepub.com. Now, this one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. And if any of you have problems with your audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. And now, let's start. We're going to, um, and please use that Q&A box to ask questions to speakers throughout the webinar. You can leave comments there. Or you can tweet to us using the special um, hashtag that we have for Tom's book, um, uh, hashtag talk critical thinking. Again, that's hashtag talk critical thinking uh, to communicate with us or using the Q&A box. Now, let's start the conversation. Uh, Mark and Tom are going to discuss issues of logic, critical thinking, fake news, and our, and our inborn bias for about half the webinar. At that point, we will open up the conversations for questions from you, the audience. But again, feel free to ask those questions while they're talking, and we'll just storehouse them and then come to them um, uh, at, at about the halfway point. So Mark, I'm wondering if you can take us away. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's great to be here, great to be talking to Tom, and, uh, and thank you, Michael, for hosting, uh, and Sage, likewise. Uh, Tom, I thought before we get into the specifically political stuff that, that's kind of signaled by the uh, title of our uh, webinar, uh, we could talk some basics about philosophical interest in critical thinking. Uh, so you're described as a tech philosopher, and uh, as you know, I, I come from a fairly traditional academic philosophical background, uh, and yet we share this interest in uh, Critical thinking. I, maybe I shouldn't say and yet. And we share this interest in critical thinking. I'm wondering maybe uh, it would be interesting for me and, and others to hear how you specifically see the relationship between tech philosophy and critical thinking. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, it was a great pleasure to be in conversation with you. And I suppose I've come to treat technology and critical thinking together in part because over the last few years from when I was a student and teaching to when I was uh, in sort of writing books about how we live now, it struck me that technology as a field is both enormously important to the texture of our lives, to our politics, it touches upon everything that we do, I mean, it's an intersection of many fields, but that it is also scrutinized in often a very, very shallow way. It's either a lightning rod for anxieties or for utopianism, um, or it's treated as a kind of landscape. And I suppose I became you know, very preoccupied with this idea 
that in our digital age, when so much that matters in so much of our lives is mediated through digital systems, it is very easy to focus on the obvious results that are offered up by those systems to us and not to think at all about their underlying structures. So critical thinking is, I guess, a lens for me, a, a lens that says it is very important, more important than ever, to look critically at the systems that we are using and their properties. To look, for example, not just at all the wonderful things I can do on my phone and not just the incredible usefulness of Google and Facebook and other services, but also to try to take several steps backwards and look at you know, what a search engine is, what it does and does not do what it means to mediate our personal relationships and our politics through social media and what we may be blind to unless we engage critically with systems themselves and with technology as something more than a kind of inevitable order of things. And I guess I'm a, I'm a child of the 1980s. I suppose the last thing I'd say is that I kind of grew up on the cusp between sort of digital eras, you know, the internet was not ubiquitous when I was young. And so I guess I saw technology arrive in these kind of waves of transformation. And it seems to me that, you know, building better technologies relies upon us not accepting the current order of things as in any way inevitable or perfect or immune from scrutiny, that what we need to do in a way is train our minds to recover the novelty of the systems we use, to unearth the hidden assumptions that govern them so that we can challenge these and interrogate them and build better and newer things and not find that a sort of hidden logic is dictating uh, much of the texture of our lives and learning. Yeah, I think that's all very well put. Um, you know, I, I uh, go back maybe a little bit farther than you um, in terms of, of personal discourse on this. But even in the 90s, I was writing about this bifurcation between technophiles and technophobes, which becomes a very unhelpful uh, duality. I mean, almost as bad as Democrats and Republicans, which we can talk about in a moment, uh, where it, it cripples thought. Uh, in a critical dimension from actually looking at the philosophical questions you've just mentioned. And I think uh, it, everything has become more pronounced and more, more uh, urgent as we've gone on from, from the 70s, 80s to now. And, uh, you know, I go back myself to sources like Martin Heidegger, who, whose essay uh, The Question Concerning Technology is, I think, required reading for anybody who wants to think these questions through critically, uh, just raising the issue of, of what we think uh, techne <laughs> is. And uh, so we, um, you know, one of, one of the, it seems to me, one of the most obvious canards in this uh, discourse is the idea that a, that a piece of technology is new, neutral with respect to its effects. Whereas uh, Heidegger reminds us in somewhat esoteric fashion, I guess, um, that when, when we create systems, as you put them, um, they have tendencies and they have underlying, underlying logics which have to be recognized and critically assessed. So um, thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to maybe focus down to the specific subject of, of your current book, uh, which is critical thinking in a general sense. and. Uh, for people who haven't yet seen the book, it's a remarkable piece of graphic design, among other things, uh, with, with marginalia and uh, places for you to scribble in your own marginalia and uh, little uh, sort of working diagrams and, and beautiful page fronts and so on. Um, so uh, Sage has done a beautiful job with this book. Um, but the content is, is in many ways very traditional. You're talking about fallacies that Aristotle identified you know, uh, two and a half millennia ago, you're talking about uh, some canonical psychological research about bias and tendencies of 
error. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, the specifics of critical thinking as a kind of uh, subject unto itself. Yes, so critical thinking as a subject has very old philosophical roots. Um, as you say, you know, we, we find ourselves looking to Aristotle a lot, and we find ourselves talking at root about logic and about being reasonable, and this idea of what it is on the one hand to reach reasonable conclusions on the basis of premises that we kind of understand, on the other hand to then take the premises and conclusions we have and test these against our knowledge of the world, test these against evidence, and thus try to have sound as well as valid arguments. And then there's the idea of coming up with reasonable explanations for things we know, seeking to ask what it is reasonable to offer as an explanation for the way things are. And, you know, this is both very old and somewhat kind of problematized today. It was important to me to have this in the book, both because I think it remains um, extremely valuable as a basic set of tools for people to ask, well, when we say be reasonable, what is it that we axiomatically kind of mean by this idea? But also, in a way, I wanted to put this traditional context of critical thinking around being reasonable against both the you know, kind of foundational recent psychological research around cognitive bias and around the, as it were, predictable ways in which we are irrational, and also around the biases built into our systems. You, know, you, you mentioned Heidegger entirely appositely, I think, as one of the you know, sort of first philosophers who really spelled out this idea that there is no such thing as a neutral tool, and that to some degree we visit our biases upon the systems we build. And my hope is that by combining these things in a very accessible package, I take what to me are a lot of the virtues of the traditional emphasis on critical thinking, which is helping people to, irregardless of the particular factual kind of content of something, ask whether it is well structured and look at where there might be weaknesses in structure, where there might be more to find out, where there might be assumptions that are dangerously under-evidenced or untested or just don't follow in what has been presented to them, which I think is an extraordinarily important contemporary set of skills. But then to locate this in the context of the biases that live not only in us, but that live in the systems we build. And I guess what I hope is that this book, which has been packaged in a very beautiful way by Sage, will be, if you like, a companion, particularly to young people starting out in their further educations, who more than ever need to be independent learners and need to be confident at differentiating between many, many sources of different quality and really, you know, sort of working out what it means to think for themselves in a context of highly manipulative cues and often very intense pressure upon time and attention and those faculties and those spaces we require if we are to attempt to be more reasonable or more modestly less unreasonable. <laughs> right. I, I think less unreasonable would be a, would, would be a reasonable goal at this stage. Uh, I, 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 this is really great because I think when I looked at the book, um, it made me think of my own students. And I teach at a large public university where there are extremely talented students and also a large population of students who are very smart but maybe not as well prepared as, as some of the elite versions of, of the same population. And one of the things we do in our philosophy programs is require them to take a course in formal logic. And as anyone who's listening will know, uh, some people do well at this, and many others don't. And it's partly because formal logic, modern symbolic logic, is uh, an artificial language which tries to isolate relationships of inference and and uh, validity, but but does so in such a way that's so abstract that many people can't relate to it. Uh, so I, I like to take them back to basics when I teach any kind of course that involves logic and talk about things like you know, what is a conditional? What is an if-then relationship? Uh, 
uh, what is the basic structure of an argument to move from premise premises to conclusions. And I think what your book is great at is, is showing us that the basics of, of how those relationships work. And then the second part is what, what you alluded to in, in your last comment, which is uh, we, we think that logic is the structure of thought. And maybe in some idealized science fictional version of the human existence, it is. But in the reality that most of us actually experience down here on the mortal plane, uh, we're, we're logical sometimes, but lots of times not. And so these things that are, are biases, especially hidden ones, the ones that we think are rational, but in fact are based on the kinds of, of confirmations or uh, people are talking now, my side bias and, and other forms of, I don't want to call them irrationality exactly, but, but um, taking us away from any sort of pure rational project. These are the things that become hardest to, to uncover and combat because we need a special set of tools to do that. Uh, so I think it, it, this is, again, what I like about the book is it feels like it has this two-prong approach. There's a lot of traditional logic here uh, presented in a very accessible way, but there's also this sense of how we can deal with the kinds of, let's call them psychocultural influences that tend to make us less than reasonable. Yes, and I, I guess I'm kind of nodding vigorously on my microphone here. <laughs> and another thing you mentioned earlier that I think is highly relevant is the importance of getting away from unhelpful binaries, uh, from the kind of Manichaean debates we used to have around technology where one person would stand up and say the internet is bad, and one person would stand up and say the internet is good, and then they would kind of uh, you know, disagree loudly while they were cheered on. And of course, this idea of unhelpful binaries where crowds of people who have no interest in doing anything other than shouting for their team and booing somebody else's team, this is something that we, we see a lot online, or that we think we see a lot. And I think in the context of reasonableness, to me it is more important than ever to get away from, to some degree, the very narrow and condescending view that people who are more reasonable have a kind of inherent superiority and that what they get to do is pour scorn upon what they view as less reasonable or less logical points of view and you know bias is a dirty word and it's something that elite scientists in particular get to say they're exempt from. Right. I think people like for example the psychologist Jonathan Haidt um, who has written very extensively about this have been very powerful in pushing back against this assumption saying, well, you know, we are, as it were, animals first, feel, feeling animals second, and thinkers in the kind of slow, highly engaged sense last of all. And in many ways, what I value from Haidt and Daniel Kahneman and others is this idea that our natural emotional responses to the world and to each other are an innate feature of our being that we're never going to escape and that is not bad as such, but that on top of this, speak like a little rider or an elephant or whatever metaphor you want to use, we have really the quite astonishing capacity to slow down sometimes, to interrogate, to describe and interrogate what it is that we are doing, to describe the world, to turn to others, to talk to them and share observations about the way things are and to, so to speak, move beyond our immediate sensations. And really, if you look at some of the psychological research, our experiencing self, our kind of emotional being in a perpetual present, is, is warring and is a different kind of entity from our remembering long-term self. I, I like the idea that the capacity to pause to think twice and to engage in the shared project of effortful self-understanding and world-understanding is you know, a difficult, rare, precious thing that we sometimes do, that we kind of deploy where it most counts, and that we call upon as a resource to sort of augment our emotional selves. But we're not trying to become purely logical beings, because as much as anything else, there is no, as it were, foundation within logic that would tell us what to prefer. There is no <laughs> contra Kant 
purely logical basis for saying that one thing is better than other, uh, that one thing is right and one thing is wrong. That's going to begin in the world of empathy, intuition, fellow feeling, judgment, all these heuristics. Yeah. So what I, really, what I really want to do is, is very strongly encourage people to try to move beyond these useless dichotomies and to try you know, to apply the astonishing gift of thought, language, attention, and self-expression, where it will bring the most meaningful benefits to their studies, to their lives, to their politics, and so on. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand online, it is tribal divisive and often full of kind of knee-jerk reactions that are humans at their worst. On the other hand, the ability to listen to and learn from other people, to hear different perspectives, to encounter things that shock you out of complacency, and to collaborate together on the shared project of better understanding ourselves and our world, that is also real. And these two things, while they're intention, are not mutually exclusive, and there's never going to be, you know, we're never going to kind of just flip over to be all on one side or all on the other side. Yeah. Um, so much in, in what you just said. Uh, I think I identified four points I want want to try to address very quickly and then move to a new um, uh, subtopic. So, yes, first of all, I think there is, as I can say this as, as someone who spent most of my life uh, reading and teaching philosophy, a kind of, let's call it platonic, Cartesian, Kantian uh, tradition of the rational aspiration to transcend the emotional, uh, to go beyond what is what are perceived as limits of, of appetite, of, uh, uh, of emotion, of, of desire. Uh, and so that these, this great conversation, this narrative of rationality, which turns out to be extremely toxic in its effects. Uh, and I think philosophers have, have for some time now recognized that. So that's one important point. And, uh, uh, and yet, it, of course, still exists. Um, second point, uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Jonathan Haidt when we were both on a panel at a, um, a conference, and I agree with you. Even when I disagree with him, I think what he's got right is the, the layering of our, our sense of being in the world. So, yes, we have rational layers, but we also have these, these layers that are uh, more primitive, let's say, if whatever the language is, or simply less logical. Uh, it's all part of who we are. It's all part of who, who uh, e each other um, happens to be and how we interact with each other. Um, the third point was um, the, uh, the bifurcation. So I just briefly, I would have to say, in, uh, in my city, Toronto, there's been a series of highly publicized, highly popular debates on various topics, uh, like uh, you know traditional things. Um, does God exist? And, uh, and people are polled when they go in uh, on their view, and then they're polled when they come out after hearing the debaters. And a, a more ridiculous intellectual exercise I can't really imagine, even though thousands, <laughs> literally thousands of people came uh, for, say, Christopher Hitchens and Tony Blair talking about God, uh, which, which seems to me exactly the wrong way to even begin to think about the question of God and the nature of, of the world. Um, anyway, so that's just by the way. So the fourth point, and this is the transition I wanted to make, uh, we, we've been kind of skirting around the political issue um, or alluding to it. Uh, what exactly can we do in an era when uh, the cry of fake news, uh, the, the, the denials of truth, the, the obvious reported falsehoods of, of uh, the President of the United States, are routine matters. Uh, what can critical thinking help us to do in this? I guess one of the interesting things is that we are seeing writ large the fact that providing corrective information that you believe be better evidence is not in itself persuasive, that things are never just about what they claim to be about. Um, and I think it's easy to be very pessimistic as a result of this and to go from the position of, well, this person has said something untrue 
and I have presented something which, uh, you know, so far as I can tell, definitively rebuts that claim. And this has made no difference. It hasn't changed minds. And I think, in a way, the, the better lesson to take from that is that there are ways of changing people's minds, but they tend to be um, by recognizing what it is that people are actually saying when they make these claims, that, that, that these are proxies to some degree. It doesn't mean that I'm indifferent to the kind of truth content or to the overt content of what people say, but in politics, in, in language and so on, as we know, you know so much of it is, is a kind of performance, is a kind of appeal. And I think what we should be interested in is getting beneath the surface claims and seeing what these things are proxies for. And of course, what they're often proxies for is who we feel we are like and who we feel we are unlike in a society. So mm -hmm. people think they are like a certain other class of people who may consider themselves to be victimized or outcast or being treated with contempt by, by others. And it is, you know, tribal in the strictest sense of the word, that broadly speaking, these things then are true because they are of my tribe. These things are true because the world view that they match is the view that I hold, and because anything that comes from outside this is poisoned and toxic. The phrase confirmation bias is, is everywhere now, um, and really it comes down to the observation that it is far easier and more comfortable and more common for us to seek out information that confirms things we already believe or would, or would like to believe than it is for us to submit our beliefs to a genuine challenge. People don't change their minds very often. And so I suppose the positives I draw from this are really that if you're going to be, if you're going to be dealing with this kind of thing in a positive way, you, you really need to accept the fact that it's partly about the system's you build the incentives embodied in those systems you know democracies are systems the democracy of the united states is a notably robust and well-designed system hopefully it will continue to be robust and well-designed um, despite what certain people do with it i think to safeguard and debate the system is important i think tech companies interestingly for all their flaws um, and perhaps hubris have looked at the systems they design and said, for instance, maybe there are dangers in having a system of information sharing that is entirely monetized and driven by how emotionally impactful that information is and where other values, such as, you know, sort of how far it corresponds to or describes reality, um, are completely secondary, that maybe we're seeing something with backlash against this. I guess one of the difficulties is that for at least a couple of decades, tech companies, Silicon Valley and many others have, if you like, peddled a version of the convenient untruth that deregulation, laissez-faire and letting the kind of marketplace of economics and ideas sort things out is all you need to do. That, uh, you know, what you need to do is... is legislate in a way that gets out of the way of technology companies' ability to kind of make money and serve the market, that what you need to do is, you know, get out of the way of media conglomerates or whatever and let them get on with things. And this is a very, very bad description of reality because, of course, what is actually happening, as so often, is that what people do is simply have undeclared ideologies and structural advantages that they then leverage to massive effect unchecked. I guess what I'm reaching towards is the idea that when people are obsessed with fake news, it often seems like they are worrying about the weather rather than the climate, that they are fixating on a, an untruth or, if you like, an inconvenient truth that is deeply objectionable to them for all kinds of reasons and that they cannot uh, let go of the intense effect that has upon them. But rather than focusing on the weather, I think we need to focus on the climate and say, well, what is the information environment like? What is the political environment like? What would it mean to build an environment in which 
truth telling or comeuppances for a lack of truth um, had some resonance down the line in which there was a more rather than a less playing field a uh, level playing field between people coming from different positions with different levels of advantage and so on you know and with the moment we start saying things like this of course it brings us back to a series of very old uh, political questions and social questions that, the, that the, the founding fathers among others debated very wisely. I guess the last thing I'd also say is I think there are huge dangers to fragmentation in that a, a central idea around free speech and many of the philosophical classic observations around free speech and so on has been the idea that there is a, a marketplace of ideas and that broadly speaking if something is said um, there will be an opportunity to kind of rebut it or address it um, and that therefore it is better to let things be said so that they can be debated taken down and, and in the long term we can perhaps make a kind of progress but the way in which technology divides and fragments and isolates people you know we talk about echo chambers and filter bubbles this idea that people deliberately or accidentally end up only hearing things to reinforce their beliefs. I think this is, in many ways, one of the, the biggest threats we have to free speech as a successfully functioning part of a democracy and to free debate as a meaningful way of testing and holding to account elected and unelected performers in our public life. And this is a really big question for the design of information systems in general, which is how what we might call public life, accountability, transparency, and so on, are maintained and supported in a structural way, rather than people being isolated in ways that are very divisive and manipulative. Yeah, I think this is really important. I mean, a couple of things uh, strike me. Um, one is, when we talk about tech companies, of course, we have to be mindful of the fact that, at least in, in some of the worst manifestations thereof, uh, it's not, it hasn't just been a kind of free market, uh, you know, let the market do its work, laissez-faire thing. It's been a post-national offshore uh, wealth cannot be constrained by regulation uh, thought regime, uh, which, which I think is, is entirely toxic, uh, and, uh, given current realities. Uh, when people uh, start thinking that their companies are bigger than countries, uh, we are in a very, very dangerous condition. And I know that's a minority view, but, but it nevertheless has been significant for some of the techno-anarchists and, and uh, post-nationalists in, in the tech sector. So that's one thing I would say. The second thing, absolutely, with respect to the free, free uh, market of ideas, you know, Mill had, J John Stuart Mill, um, this idea that, that uh, good ideas would drive out bad ones. But that really only works if you have a healthy market. And one, one thing that, this goes in a way back to the tech question, people think of, as you said, they often think of tech as inevitable. And people often think of markets as inevitable too. But markets are made up of people and desires. That's what they are. Um, they're, they're not supernatural beings. Uh, so when we think about the marketplace of ideas, we're really thinking about ourselves. And we should be thinking about what a, what a conversation looks like. So the isolationism that you talk about, um, the, the, the in-bubbling, uh, I think, you know, uh, to go back to another earlier point, the, this idea that there are red and blue states or, or counties or people in the United States, this is very, very, very bad for thinking. Uh, I do have a critical question, though, and I want maybe if you can push this along a little. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned classical liberal in some ways. I think that dialogue is the answer to, to differences, uh, that we can have political agreement even when we have ethical disagreement. Uh, you know, I'm a Lockean in that sense. Uh, but I've made this argument in the last couple of years, and there's been some interesting pushback, especially from younger thinkers who say, I don't want to listen to somebody who is so disagreeing with me. I don't want to listen to people who have what I regard as heinous views. I don't think that teaches me anything. Uh, I don't think that it ennobles the, the discourse. I just want them to either stop talking or go away. Uh, and I think we can say, well, there are clear limit cases, like, say, neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. Um, 
But I think this is a really interesting question right now. I mean, are we are, are that small elements of listing people? I'm sorry, I very slightly lost you at the end of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just saying, asking the question about engaging with people, uh, a, a political modus vivendi or, or some kind of structure mm. of, of tolerance. Uh, some people have said to me, especially in the last two years or so, that they don't even want to engage with people they disagree with because they don't see any value in it. Yeah, and it, I think the starting point for me is perhaps as for, for many liberals, particularly in the more you know, volatile political eras in some ways in which classical liberalism emerged, you know, the, 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 the ubiquitous threats of mob and other violence of the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah, I mean, it's quite, quite different thing when, when people were killing each other over their, their political disagreements, right? Well, absolutely. And so I think, in a way, one thing we perhaps have, have risked losing sight of is the idea that being able to sit with someone who profoundly disagrees you and use words rather than violence and also being able to exchange views with someone with whom you profoundly disagree but where one of you is not invested with uh, an automatic authority that allows the other person to, to kind of shut up or go away that this is in human historical terms a rare and precious privilege and one that is very hard won and one that needs to be defended. Um, and you know, many philosophers and thinkers have made this point. Um, you know, perhaps, I suppose, perhaps, you know, kind of most, most famously, we've we've had the point made by Popper. Um, you know, who talked about the central importance of being intolerant and intolerance. Um, which I think is sometimes perhaps slightly misunderstood. Uh, he wasn't being paradoxical. He was simply saying that to defend the peaceful exchange of violently opposed views against those who are interested in simply silencing opposing views is to defend a, a free and an open society, and is also to depend is also to defend one of the very best models we've come up with for, for what you might call progress, which rests upon the central idea that on any issue we will not be able to prove any answer is definitively right. We will never bring any issue of real import to a close. There will be no end to human debate about pretty much everything. Um, and given that, the very best thing we can do is not seek to bring debate to a close by unilateral violence-backed imposition, but what we can do is seek to defend the free expression of many different perspectives. Now that's very vague and maybe that's you know sort of a classic, uh, classic kind of out-of-touch liberal thing to say, but I do tend to feel that a very dangerous road is trod when we go too far along the, the routes other than listening. So Michael yeah. Sandel was writing, I thought very interestingly, about the idea that when people are expressing very far right-wing views in America um, and doing so in a very openly aggressive manner, it is we have perhaps a moral obligation if we disagree with that and view this as, as wrong or evil. Uh, you know, it is okay to physically confront people, um, you know, to punch a Nazi, so to speak, that this is fine. And, uh, you know, Sandal made, I think, what I thought was a very important point, that if we go out onto the streets, we being people who, uh, you know, sort of disagree with this or think it's, think it's wrong and, and punch Nazis, um, or things to that effect, then, among other things, that sends out the message that our society is broken, that our society is 
not able to defend us against this, that our society and its structures of civility, of law, of policing and so on, are too weak or too corrupt to protect citizens against things they view as dangerous. And that, therefore, it is perhaps a society in which more and more people are going to need to take up arms to defend themselves against others, and in which the weakness of central authority is to be taken as a given, and so on. And I think there is a danger that when we say, not only I don't want to listen to you, so I'm not going to, but also extrapolate from that, and nobody should listen to you, and you should not be allowed to speak. We're partly saying, because what you have to say is too dangerous and too offensive, and because the, the reaction to it is not one of engagement and dispute, um, you know, perhaps very angry and vociferous dispute, the engagement uh, is one of silencing of various kinds of violence or exclusion. Um, and I think that really does risk weakening the most important structures of a society. Um, it's, I mean, this is perhaps not quite relevant, but I was just, sorry, the last thing I'll say is I thought there was a very, a line from Martin Luther King Jr. going around recently um, about the degree to which many of the actions taken during the civil rights struggle were akin to people, akin to people, akin to a doctor who had diagnosed severe cancer and was then attempting to deal with the disease that he had diagnosed. And the point was that by engaging explicitly with these things in, in non-violent ways, albeit in, in, in the mode of, mode of resistance, this was not causing problems. This was not something culpable. This was responding to an explicit diagnosis, but that what was important was words as well as actions, and that the actions were not the actions of a matching violence, that the actions were something better, that they were a genuine, radical, transforming, courageous alternative. Yeah. I think, I, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty sure we agree down the line on this, or almost down the line. I feel like there, there are sort of different responses I've had personally, especially to, to my younger intellectual friends uh, who say things like, revolution is not about understanding, it's about change. Uh, and, I, and I just want to say um, that they should be historically minded and look at, look at the Jacobins, look at the Maoists. You know, I mean, I think you want to be careful how far you take a program of that kind of, of, that kind of consciousness changing forcible. Um, yeah, and well, the, I think the other thing is about changing live people into dead people. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, and the other thing is, I, I, I do quite understand when, when somebody says to me, um, I had a, a young student uh, who's a woman of color say, you know, I'm, I'm tired of explaining myself to white people. And I get that, you know, and if you don't want to engage, you personally don't have to. But, but there is still this project I, I hope. I mean, I you know, you and I and Michael Sandel and others. I, I hope we're not just old white guys who who are the last liberal standing. I mean, I I I'd like to believe that there is this project of of civil discourse. I've spent most of my career defending it. Um, hopefully, uh, I mean, I I mean that in the proper gra grammatical sense, um, that that this is the right answer. And uh, that, as you say, quite, I mean, it's quite right. If, if anyone can be attacked, then everyone can be attacked. And the weak are going to be the ones who suffer because they're always the ones who suffer. So, uh, you know, I, I, I might have a, a, a desire to punch a Nazi, but it's not the right thing to do. And uh, that seems like a strange thing to even have to say, but uh, these are strange times. Gentlemen, before we start punching Nazis, I wonder if we might be able to get a, a couple of questions in um, uh, from the audience. Great. 
And uh, again, to remind people that they can use the Q&A box at uh, the right of their screen to ask questions, or they can uh, tweet to us at TalkCriticalThinking, hashtag TalkCriticalThinking uh, via Twitter. Um, I, I, I'm going to move us away from uh, 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 fascism for, for just a moment and kind of go back to the, the market. We'll go back to capitalism and the marketplace of ideas. Um, one of the things, if I go to the to a grocer, I will see milk and eggs and cheese and flour. I, I'm guaranteed to see those things. But if I go to the marketplace of ideas, there isn't often a kind of a, a shared literacy of facts anymore. And this is this is something that's brought to our attention by Greg Gutkowski in the in the audience. The, many students have no basic knowledge of science and history to base their critical thinking on. So his question is whether it's a lack of knowledge or is it a lack of critical thinking is one of the things that we are seeing right now. I'll say the traditional thing when you asked a difficult question, which is that's a great question. <laughs> I think critical thinking doesn't exist in a vacuum. And perhaps one of the unfortunate implications of saying that critical thinking should be taught is the implication that there is a methodology which you can you know, apply anywhere into everything that is kind of marvelous and critical. I think our ability to think critically in practice always grows out of a particular context and always grows out of knowledge. And one of the things I suppose that interests me is that I think it's more difficult than ever to have a kind of shared, common, agreed upon canon of knowledge. Um, and maybe this isn't a very bad thing. Uh, you know, sort of maybe there are deep problems with, with, with canons um, that we are better off without. But I do think that something that a lot of people lack that would be of enormous benefit to them is a very kind of deeply felt and deeply thought encounter with, with one particular area. And to have had the experience of going in depth to you know, it might be something as simple as to how how a particular book was written, to the you know phenomena around a particular um, you know sort of event, a particular piece of history, to have studied a little bit of biology in depth and so on. But what I mean is, once you really go into depth on how some knowledge was created, on how that knowledge is debated, on how it has been so to speak, put together by different people. Once you have gone deep yourself, it's at that point that the questions that constitute critical thinking come alive for you because you begin to ask, well, how was this data, this information kind of made or generated? Why do there, are there disagreements around this? What is it that we don't know? How do we know what we do know? What is it reasonable to believe on the basis of this? And interestingly, when I am doing talks and presentations and going to schools and things like that, I find things like social media are an astonishingly useful way of getting young people to start putting these skills into practice because most people have intensely well-developed critical faculties around certain areas of social media. You take it for granted that there are many, many layers of meaning in every utterance that you read between the lines, that just because someone has a fantastic series of pics on Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook about their holiday, it doesn't mean that their holiday was exactly like it looks on Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook, you know, and Facebook, and that when somebody says something to you on social media, you don't just take it at face value. You interpret everything from you know, whether they had geolocation on and off to what else is going around, to how quickly they've responded to you, to who they've copied in, and so on and so on and so on. And so my very long answer, I guess, is that I think there are huge benefits to digging deeply into something with a narrow focus and on that basis starting to tease out underlying questions about what is really going on, um, about what the complexities are, um, and that it is often the greatest lack for people is not their lack of a kind of common scientific ground, but of the experience of going deep, going meaningfully deep, having the kind of freedom serendipitously to probe something um, and really develop their own analysis and perspective on it. Um, can I just add very quickly, I think that uh, that that's all uh, very, very important. Uh, 
it's important too though that people respect the basic methodologies of science and and the scientific method um, not in a kind of slavish way not in a, a you know replacement deity way but uh, Tom mentioned Popper and his political views a few moments ago his philosophy of science is is you know basically one phrase conjecture and refutation uh, that's a method you you posit something and then you test it and the results are the results and it's not a matter of two sides you know this is another one of those those bifurcations it's not a it's not a question of debate whether um, a scientific result that that has been uh, proven again and again and again is true it just is true it might not be the final truth about the world or the universe but it's true in its context and it's useful just to that extent. So knowing that and respecting that is, I think, essential to any sort of rational debate. So I have a, yeah. another question. You, you, you like the last one that you thought was a little bit difficult. This one's going to get even, even worse, I'm afraid. Um, this is from <laughs> Nancy Hughes. A student comes in and says President Trump is racist based on his statement about four troubled countries. How do I respond? So given what you've talked about, how do you respond? I feel I should turn this one over to Mark first thing. He's a oh, well, more practicing well, academic than wait, me. Yeah, is, is the question whether what he said is racist or not? Because clearly it is. I, I think the question, and I, I'm going to interpret for, for Nancy, is, is this, what, what does someone who is, uh, would presumably be a critical thinker, how do you respond to someone who comes in something like that with, with some sort of question like that? How do I help, how do I guide somebody through the thought process that comes to a, a rational uh, decision or a, a, a rational thought on that. Right, okay. I mean, I guess... Uh, Less than the validity and, of the actual statement. Yeah, and I guess uh, Tom can chime in on this too in terms of method. I mean, it, 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 is, it goes back to the kinds of things that we think are relevant when it comes to making rational decisions and judgments. What is the evidence? Uh, so none of us, apart from those eight lawmakers were in the room when President Trump allegedly made that these remarks about Haiti and Africa. Uh, who do we trust? Do we trust Dick Durbin? Do we trust the Republicans? Do we trust the president? We have to weigh all of those things. Then we have to say, how much does it matter if the specific language was uh, full or house, as the current debate is, does that matter with respect to what is actually going on in terms of policy. And then the, the larger question is, does it matter if the president has these views? And I think it does, uh, but I'm not an American voter and I, I, uh, I you know, I'm not gonna presume to judge anybody else uh, except intellectually, not, not morally, uh, for, for whatever judgments they make. But these are the kinds of questions you have to ask. What, what's evidentiary? What's uh, inferential? Uh, what can what conclusions can we draw and I think when you go back to basics like that you can first of all I mean this goes back to a point that Tom made you can get away from some of the, the tribalism a little bit because you can focus on method you can say you know how how do you draw your conclusions what are they based on and what what is the imagined opponent trying to argue uh, and maybe we can even get beyond uh, a binary uh, so, I mean, these are the kinds of intellectual moves that, that one might make that I think actually advance the discourse. Yes, and if we're talking about trying to be helpful to people, um, I think it can be helpful to people to say, you are not obliged to have an instant, strong, and immovable view on something. It is okay to be shocked by something, to find it challenging, to find it difficult, to find it intense, to find it overwhelming. It is okay to entertain doubts. It doesn't make you a bad person to say, I do not know whether this is racist or not. It doesn't make you a bad person to say, these other people seem very, very sure, <clears throat> and they seem immensely confident in what they believe. Um, I am less confident and I feel bad about being less confident. I think, as it were, honest doubt um, is a good thing if honest doubt is something that you then 
as Justice Mark was saying, sort of ways of addressing. What do you know and how do you know it? What do you think the question means? What do you think different people involved mean when they say things? How can you, your doubts lead you to a position of greater certainty? Who do you trust? Who is reliable? But it is okay not to have a trendy hot take on everything and to be honest I myself am very uncomfortable with the sort of demand on so many people so much of the time to have instant strong views about everything and I think a little perspective is sometimes very helpful and what I mean by that is not saying this stuff doesn't matter is not saying oh well we can't know but it's just saying you cannot feel intensely about everything every minute of the day very rapidly without there being some real you know sort of loss in terms of your ability to differentiate to your own satisfaction between what really matters to you what you are more or less sure about, what the important questions are going forward. Um, me personally, I, I try to spend less and less time on social media. I try to, you know, sort of, in a way, have more signal and less noise in my life by giving myself a bit more space. But maybe that's a product of, of privilege and age and so on. But I do think, you know, one can reassure people that thinking for themselves is about having a, a good and an honest method for exploring their own doubts and uncertainties and feelings but there is absolutely no pressure constantly to be broadcasting strong certain feelings about everything I have a, a, I'm going to challenge that just a little bit with a question from from Donald Benson and it's not so much that you necessarily have to have a a B, have a strong opinion at all times, but it, you have to identify, you used the word Manichaean earlier, you, you have to identify with the camp, a lot of people feel. So his specific question is, my concern is about the challenge of individual isolation from social systems we currently belong to when we start thinking critically. So there is a price to being a critical thinker, um, and I'm just wondering, how, does, how do you handle that? Well, that's very okay. interesting. You know, you can make on people, you know, axiomatically being critical makes people uncomfortable um, that you know a, a, a reassuring response um, is often preferred to a challenging response um, I think actually you know practicing the idea that that what we might call critical thinking is a kind of one-size-fits-all solution to how to be and what to do and how to deal with others is just wrong um, you know uh, my, uh, Roman Krasnarich, the um, cultural thinker, has written a fine book called Empathy, and he makes the case that empathy in its many forms is a skill we should put at the heart of education and our lives, um, that dealing empathetically and tactfully with others around us, not every single person perhaps, but even those who disagree. So I, I would want to, I don't want to put critical thinking up on a throne and say that your first reaction to everything should be to rigorously and religiously follow a kind of agenda of um, critique and you know, sort of highly, highly rational agenda setting that, that you're not allowed to um, do anything that might be construed as sort of tribal. Um, I think you have to deploy it very selectively and it can be very helpful to, to be a critical observer of your own feelings rather than other people's. I think in a way this idea that critical thinking is something that has um, a purely outward focus and it's a kind of weapon or a tool that you use against others. I, I think first and foremost you should practice observing your own thoughts, practice observing your own reactions to other people um, and really begin with trying to come to a better accommodation with your own tendencies and worries and insecurities and, uh, and reactions, uh, rather than thinking that this is some tool, methodology, or weapon that you're obliged constantly to inflict on others. 
Um, I, I'm going to uh, maybe bring the tone a little down by mentioning a Simpsons episode, which some people may remember, where Homer Simpson discovers that he has a crayon lodged in his brain. And uh, when an explosive sneeze removes the crayon, he's suddenly much more intelligent and critical. And the only friend he has is daughter Lisa, who has a graph showing a negative correlation between intelligence and happiness. <laughs> and and so he asks her for coping strategies, and she says, Tai Chi and Chai Tea. Uh, and C Homer can't deal with being <laughs> being a critical, uh, critically intelligent person, so he has the crayon reinserted in his brain. Um, this is... Uh, a, a parable, I guess. Um, everybody should be critically intelligent. As Tom says, it's it's not isolating. Uh, it might feel at first. I mean, I see this from my students a lot. They feel, especially beginning students, they feel at odds with their, their family beliefs or cultural beliefs. But it's it's the community of reason, and it, it's the thing that, that joins us across all of these differences, if we can only make it so. Well, well, thank you for that. And I, I for one, uh, uh, never feel the Simpsons make, well, maybe the current Simpsons do, but uh, the, in general, I think the Simpsons elevate the conversation. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that is uh, all the time we have uh, for today. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. And I want to give a special thank to you, uh, Tom Chatfield and Mark Kingwell. In the coming weeks, expect an email that includes a link to view the archive webinar and, uh, um, and well as, and we are hope to get some answers to some of the questions that we did not get to today. And that will all be hosted on socialsciencebase.com. So again, thank you both, Tom and Mark, and thank you to the audience. And uh, we'll talk again soon, I hope. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Uh, very pleasurable.